Thank you. So now, let's start. So, good morning. I think it's good morning. So, my name is Felipe Pires again. I'm a Brazilian, but I live in Portugal in this moment with my big family. Yeah, I have four children. Maybe I'm crazy, probably. And today, my idea is to, um, to talk more about the something that I would like to think because we saw in the last um, presentations about debuggers and debuggers, more analysis and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. But we need to understand how those bases work. And the idea behind of this talk is explain about those bases and how important it is to use those bases for each field when you talk about the cybersecurity, right? So this is my contact at Twitter. Uh, I, I like to share many open source tools there. So if you'd like to follow me and send me a message, send me tools, I like to test as well. So other contacts that I have, a small, simple web page. We can find some talks there about the same topic and other talks. And my GitHub, you can find some research that I made in some security uh, vendors, actually. And um, of course, I share with those reports with the vendors, and I talk with them to improve the solutions and stuff like that. And my LinkedIn, right? So who am I? I will pass very fast. I'm security research at Sapporo. Sapporo is a startup from Switzerland. I'm responsible for creating attack modules from, for this app. So I need to understand how the attack, how the attacker explore vulnerability or using permissions in the cloud and on-premise environment. And I need to create those you know, scenarios. And I send to the developer team, and the team create to the intelligence of the product. It's very nice. And I'm a founder of this organization. It's a small company for now. It's a black, black white technology. It's my company. And it's a kind of reseller company, actually. And I'm a developer advocate of this uh, open source project, Cube Shop, specifically looking for the testers. Uh, it's more when you talk about the software development lifecycle and stuff like that. And I'm advocate of those projects, mainly to the, to the, of the, of the of this is specifically, it's a hacking, it's not a crime, it's a very nice project, starting in the US. The idea behind of this project is to explain more about the hacking concept, right? And how you can use in this in your life. Because hacking is really not a crime. Because when you talk about the crime, it's a cyber criminal, is, um, you know, the people need to pay for that. Not a hacking. Hacking is a life si life lifestyle and how you look in from the software, how do you use your creative mind. Let's suppose if you are a soccer player and you do bad things like a cream, you t you, you, in this moment, you're no more, a, you're no more a, a soccer player. You are a criminal, right? So that's the point. Unfortunately, the newspapers and TV needs to pick up one person and call this person as a hacker. The bad guy, but it's not. Hack is not a, it's not a crime. Another project, it's a DEFCON groups for my friend Jason. I'm a, a lead of this project in Sao Paulo, one of those leads in Sao Paulo. It's a community like this that we can share the knowledge of security. And others is Senha Segura, is specifically about the solutions for organizations. And SNIC is a SAST solution, is application security for, for the software action, uh, analysis in code. And this last. I'm a right, structured writer and reviewer from those three magazines. This slide is very important for my mother because of that. I'd like to share with you, OK? But anyway, so very fast, what is a thread? Just to put all those people on the same page, simple definition, another definition from Philippe from this ISO is a kind of potential incident. Maybe it's a software attack, theft intellectual property, maybe identity theft, sabotage, and information storage are examples of information threats. The point is, if you see here, all those things is related to a, a software. Maybe it's a code, maybe software, maybe application, or maybe a binary. But if you see all those things, is about the code, right? OK, so when you start your research or your analysis, when you talk about the, the malware analysis specifically or hunting something, first you have an artifact or a sample, because you don't know if it's malicious or not, right? So this is the first step, identification. I will show you after some small comments and stuff like that. And you, you need to understand if it's malware, it's a malicious software, or maldoc, malicious document. 
And after that, you can choose what the best methodology you can apply, okay? A statistic analysis and dynamic analysis, so two different approach. Maybe you are thinking, where is reverse engineering? Reverse engineering is a technique that you can use in both of those methodologies, right? So when you perform something like this, my recommendation is a suggestion, actually, when you do something like this, it's important to register all those steps. Why? Because you can learn more about those steps and mainly about the technique used by the attacker, what kind of technique. And after that, you can prepare an article, you can prepare a talks, and you can present a report for your manager. It's good for a manager, right, or coordinator or like this, because you can explain those steps and how you discover what is the way that the attacker is using your organization. Not only that, but you can improve defenses mechanisms because you will understand what kind of technique the attacker used in your environment and what kind of solution the attacker bypassed in your environment. Because of that, it's very important. And not only that, but you can create in this beautiful name called it CTI, or Cyber Threat Intelligence. It's a beautiful name, right? I know that is. It's very difficult to implement that, but you can use it in some tools to automatize the process for help you, okay? And of course, other beautiful word is uh, training cyber resilience because the, the, the threads are changing all the time. Okay, nice. So what is a statistic analysis? Simple definition, basically is the first step when you talk about the more analysis or thread hunting. When you're looking more about the binary, not about the tools, because when you talk about thread hunting, you need to hunting using tools, right? But how you can look in from the binary, because in the end of the day, our idea is to figure out how the attacker is using the binary to explore the environment, how the technique they're using to inject something in the binary, and stuff like that. Because of that, it's the first step when you talk about the MARI studies. Not only that, because this, the analysis, the statistic analysis, analyze the process of the specifically program code, or if have some library, what kind of function is important by this library, if this library make sense or not make sense with the, the system operation, if using the, the DLL or, or specifically uh, library inside of the Unix platform, for example. And this specific analysis doesn't run at this time the file. So you're using some commands, you see some results, and here's my, the point of this talk. What is the result when you executing the tool? Because sometimes when we analyze something, we perform the tool, you see the results, and you think, Oh, this tool doesn't work for me. I don't find anything for this binary. But actually, we can find some results, but we don't know how we can interpret that or in understand, actually, the, the result of this command, okay? So because of this, it's more safe. And on the other hand, you have dynamic analysis. is a kind of analysis based on behavior, when you can put in this malware in a specific place, and you can analyze the behavior. So I have a question for you. When you talk about the dynamic analysis, you can use in this, this concept called sandbox, right? So you're putting your binary inside of this specific, specifically controlled environment, and you can run the binary inside of that, and you can see all those behavior, right? So my question is, so if I create in the virtual machine in my environment, I have a sandbox, yes or no? Yes, hands up, no? Maybe? No? The people are shaming me. I don't believe in the security events that people are ashamed. I need to talk, I need to talk bad words like a fuck you. Yeah, okay. So actually, here we have an important information. When you talk about the sandbox, we need to have different engines inside of that. So of course, it's a virtual machine that you can execute the binary inside of that, but you need to have these engines because those engines will be responsible for give you the result if this binary is malicious or not, based on those engines, based on those intelligence, right? Like you, probably you already heard about the anti, uh, virus total, right? Scanning. So you put in the binary there or URL. So they, ha they have many engines inside of this platform, like uh, others, like a uh, Joey Sandbox or other hybrid cloud or other sandbox. So when you try or you would you like to create your sandbox? You need to have those engines inside of your environment, right? So just a simple concept. Very nice. OK, let's talk about the binary, or the first steps when you talk about the binary, as I mentioned it with you. So first, remember, we, we, have the, um, oops, we have the identification step. I have here many files. Let me put here. I think it's more easy to see. So 
we need to understand how those fires is exactly, what kind of type. So the first step is to identify. Remember in the flow, so identification steps is pretty simple. So first of all, I would you like to see what kind of file I have here. So it's a simple Amazon. I use file command, right? So how many people heard about this command? It's simple. Thank you, God. Answers. Nice. And the second is malware doc text. It's a probably a text. It's a text. Nice. So let's read what I have inside of this text. Nice. What I have here? A simple Python code, right? Is that correct or not? See, yeah. No? I heard no. Let's try what happened now. Cool. It's a malware. It's a it's a Python, okay? But the extension is different. Okay, something works here. So I have a question again. So what is well, how type works? So what information the type collects from the binary to identify this specifically binary? Do you know what is, for example, let's check whether is a um, file sample here. No. Sample. Take a look at this. It's a kind of different when you s if you see here. I have a two text files, but one of these is a Python script, executable. And this is different, you see? So what do you think about that? Why the difference between the files? Sorry, man, I can't hear you. Maybe, I don't understand my baby, okay? <laughs> probably, pro I, I, I really, I, sorry, I don't, probably they have a microphone, but uh, sorry for that. But here is one uh, specifically key, how the file works. That's the point here. So, oh no, Philip, I need to read the manual. Yeah, I don't like the read manual, but file works, actually file looks for any specific information ins inside of the binary. And this information, it's here. So if you read the book, not the book, the manual, you see here the magic. You see? It's a kind of tip here. Actually, this concept is called magic number. How many people heard about that? Thank you, God, answers again. So nice. So basically, file works in this way. So they try find this to find this information in so this file here, this file here, have a magic number stored in a particular place in the beginning of the file. You see? So that's, this is the information that the file use has a base to find that. But Philippe, how this works? So actually, of course, file is, is compiled inside of the Unix, Unix platform. They have a database inside of that to check those magic numbers. Not only one specifically, but Let's see here, I think I download here. I don't remember, but I think I remember, uh, yeah. File, magic, magic gear, yeah. And let's see, take a look at that. This is the database. I download this from the Debian to see the, how the database works. So let's check, for example, Python. This is a kind, this is a kind of um, rules, actually or magic number that the file the file used when they check the file, right? So as you can see here, some informations like this. Take a look at this, interesting. They're using some rules and strings to define those files, right? So if you see here, three double quotes. And if I, if I return here, for example, Let's um, change something here. So if I change here, for example, and put those three quotes, and I will save this. Let's see if the description change. You see? Why? The question is simple. Why change? Because I changed the reference of the magic number in this specifically file, right? So if I change once again, Um, let's check here, percent PDF, that's one doc, eight. 
save. And now we have a what? We have a PDF file. It's a simple magic number manipulation. Of course, it's a simple because it's a text file. I'm not talking about the PE, Portable Executable, or ELF for Unix, or other, or Metro for a Mac OS. No, it's just so for, for a text file, right? And if I using, for example, PDF ID, it's a tool to check some strings in a PDF file. Take a look at this. The identification is these tools understand that this file is a really a PDF, but it's not a PDF. It's a Python. Is that correct or not? Right? So I am manipulate something, but the tool, because of that, the tool is important to give you the result. But you need to understand the result of those tools. Maurer analysis is a very nice topic to understand about the reverse engineering, but we need to understand those bases. Because when you perform something, you can understand if your attacker are using some techniques since the base to the advanced, right? So other things interesting here is about that. Let me show you. Let me go to the Windows. I think I have here, yeah, Windows. And I have here some files, OK? And not here. Let me go to the, I start with Linux. I think it's better, Linux. So I have here some files, OK? Let me check if it's, it's, it's executable or not. OK, this is a ELF binary, OK? It's executable. So let me check another. Maybe it's a text, OK? So take a look at this. Another super simple tools to using in the first steps, in the first, when you talk about the more analysis, is Strings, right? Dash O to, to see all those things. Now you check for the first arables. OK? And I put the pipe less here to start the beginning. Take a look at this. What kind of the first information you can find by strings? This is the first string mentioned by these tools, right? But when you using uh, X uh, to, to find some hexadecimal to to changing, to convert actually the, the um, hexadecimal information for the string. Let's see what happened now in this for the same, oh no, it's, it's XT. Oh, this is the first string. So something are happening here. Put it here. Not yet, not yet. So where is the, the, the reference of the strings, remember? Not yet. OK. Let's me changing. How many bytes? 16, 600, maybe? Yeah, here. This is the reference of the string, the first string. Remember? Yes or no? Yeah. But here, it's really the first string. And when you're looking from the structure of the ELFI, you can understand what those 16 reference here is, for example, um, meaning, actually, when you're looking from the structure of the ELFI. I will show you after. But here I have a one in interesting point. So why those letters doesn't appear when you execute in the string command? What do you think about that? Two shorts. Maybe it's a good answer. It's a good answer. And the explanation is simple. It's here. in the beginning of this fucking manual. Um, no, not this. Yeah. What is the explanation? Oh, what is, is a key? Strings, yeah, thank you. One letter here. This is the answer. It's a short, but it's after four letters. You see? 
simple. It's bases. And we need to understand those bases, so how the binary works and all those things, but not only that, but how the tools. For example, um, let me go to the file here once again. I will talking about the um, structure of the, EU, the Linux, right, the Unix. Where is the file here when they define the structure? It's here, elf.batch8. Okay, elf dash eight is in the beginning here. Here, cool. And um, so here is the structure of the PDF, the elf. And here we can understand how this works since the beginning. For example, we have a specific array of the, the information, specifically bytes in the beginning, how is uh, created those words, as words, the words, and so on and so on. And, uh, and the header of the, the, the health that we have, the health file, the health file that we have here. In the beginning, we have the first array that we have 16 bytes, right? The first array is called e identity. The identity, actually. And what kind of information we have inside of this is specifically 16 bytes. We have a magic number and others informations. Very nice. What kind of information we have? So if you go there, you can see these words, the letters, elf. Take a look at this. So this is the first position, right? Zero. And this magic number. The second is E. Third, L. Fourth, elf. F. So this is the structure of the the the, the alpha file. Not only that, but if you, if you go there, you can understand those positions. For example, let me split other things here. And um, so let me compare some files to show you here. It's XD, um, any 32, uh, 16, better, Erebus. And another is XD, any 36. Uh, 16. Um, Linux, I think it's have it in 32. Yeah. OK. So let's compare. You can see there? I think you can see. OK. So if you see here, in the beginning, it is the, is the same, right? The same information that you can find here. So those reference about the structure of the elf. And when you go there, let's compare here about those informations. Let me see here. So and the and this position if is zero two is what? Sixteen bytes. Sixty four bytes, right? So and the second one is not two, it's zero, one. Why? Because it's 32 bytes. You see? So let's check another. So about the structure, it's the same case. The position seven. So if you, if you see some difference, we can check how the tools works when you're looking from the binary. So that's the key. So we need to understand how when you use some tools, how these tools can help you, but you need to understand deeply not only the tool, but the concepts of the binary. That's important, and that's the idea of this conversation, right? So cool. This is the, when you talk about the portable executable, I just mentioned I had some structure about that. It's very simple. You have a sample here. You have it divided in two ways, a, a header and session. And inside of the header, we have many informations like uh, um, MZ uh, signatures, PE signatures, and stuff like that. And you have the sessions. And this specific session is usually the place that, usually, is the place that the attacker is using to input in something malicious, like in this um, <coughs> doc text, doc data, or something like this. And this specific session, doc or S or C, usually is the, um, the session using for the icon or the, the binary that are pieced to the users, okay? 
Nice. And this is the Elf, as I mentioned. It. It's almost, almost, it's not the same, but almost the same. They have a header, session, and stuff like that, OK? So nice. So let's talk about other structure, about the, P the PDF, OK? So PDF has specifically four, struct four uh, parts, actually. The header, the body, cross-reference table, or X table, and trailer, right? So basically, it's divided in this way. So this print by so basically is from the DJ Stevens blog. It's the person that the researcher very known about the more analysis and other things like this topic specifically. And this is the how the PDF organized those things, right? So you can see the header, and you see the body. When you see the funny things like a color, you know, page images. And the cross-reference table, you have allocations of the objects if in the file for access random, like uh, you have a specifically first object, like a, a root object, OK? And you have our others uh, two child. And after that, in object two or three, remember of this kind of three, you have another reference. So object four and five may connect it to the object two. Others objects connect to um, an object three. All those uh, objects are referenced each one, OK? Nice. I will explain more when you talk about the virtual machine. I think it's easier to explain this. And um, nope. OK. Let me return here my PDF files. OK, here I have some PDFs. And um, for example, PDF ID is a tool from DJ Stevens. Did he even create these tools, basically? So if you see here, I have, in this case, this PDF, they have the header. It's small, but OK. We have a header, as I mentioned. It. We have the body with many things like pages. And we have uh, uh, objects. In this case, we have a six, 63 objects. And we have 22 streamings. Usually, this stream is, is a part important inside of the PDF that the attacker is using to put in something malicious. They can, they, they can use, it, of course, the URL you know, in, in other parts, but usually they put in something obfuscated, encoded inside of this streaming. Okay? So they need to use in something to uncompress things. And of course, to, to check those informations, we need what? Uncompress, right? OK, so let me share other. Um, other PDF. I have here, for example, no, for, no file, PDF, PDF ID. I have a Thor. In this case, nice, PDF ID. In this case, it's almost different. It's, it's not, too, not too much object, 18. Uh, not stre streaming, 16 streaming. And they have here in specifically open action. Open action? Yeah, open action. So it means one thing very interesting. When you have this flag in a PDF, it means that the user don't need to interact more than once with this PDF. The only thing the user needs to do is to open the PDF. And after that, something happens automatically. This is the function of the open action. So it's interesting to see, to investigate more about that. They have a specifically object streaming here. So another point to investigate. And, and as you can see, and I show you about the PDF, we have a different things here. So some PDF has more than 15 objects. So it's too big. And more than 20 streamings is too big that we need to investigate. It's the same case. In this case, it's not too big. It's not too much object. It's just 18. But <laughs> maybe each one of these objects has a streaming. So becomes this more difficult to investigate because we need to look for each streaming to see what kind of thing we can find there. OK? Nice. Let me return it to the demo, and I will finish my presentation, OK? And um, so I have here one specifically file in PDF that I received, like a CV, something the people receive. If the people works in HR team, receive every day the PDF, OK? So first, I checked the version. Of course, I, I check other things if, is, if this file is really PDF or not. The second tool that I used here is a PDF ID, 
right, to check how many objects I have here. So I have here how many objects? 15. In this case, I have a look, just only two streams, <laughs> okay? And, but they have here, if you see, we have here five, maybe, or two JS reference, JavaScript, and other specifically JavaScript, and in this case, it's three. And the same case, they have an open action here, as you can see. So very interesting when I made this investigation because they have a specific object, and they have a specifically open action, and they have maybe five JavaScript. So maybe those things are linked. So I need to investigate, or I investigate more to, to see about that. Other tool that I use here, in this case, is a PDF parser. It's a, it's a part of the package of those tools. And you can find it in, the, in Kali Linux or Parrot OS, and you can find there. So just to see some comments that I can search inside of the, the PDF. So first of all, you com compare this reference. Remember when I used PDF ID, I found five JavaScript. So this is the first one, the reference, object one, object seven, and object th 12. So three JavaScript. Another is JS, only two, right? If I'm correct, only two. OK, nice, only two. So OK, I use two different tools to achieve the same, actually not the same, but the same results, because just to compare the results. But now I need to look more deeply about those JavaScript, because for me, it's totally suspicious, right? It's suspicious for you? JavaScript with PDF. <laughs> it's very <laughs> suspicious. So it's malicious. So let's finish the presentation then. Because the idea is to, yeah. No, OK. So the, the next, I using the, this, this flag, because the idea is to look in from the raw data for filters to actually to open all those information inside of this specifically PDF, OK? So if you see here, so let's walk through for this specifically PDF. So we have here the object one. And take a look at this three, remember? the structure of the PDF, object one referring those six objects. Remember those, the three? Object one and more than one, the child files. And take a look at this, one interesting information. So the open action is totally linked with a JavaScript. So I can suppose now that when the user opened the PDF, what happened? Some JavaScript running, right? Is that correct? I'm supposing, because that's, this is the information. But here it's interesting. I heard something, or many things I heard, actually, from the some guys that, ah, this tool this doesn't work. Why? Because appears some errors for us. Actually, it's not error. I am not using, in this moment, the correct tools to find this information. Is that, the, of course, some, some, sometimes we try to using in problem happen, of course. But in this case, or in many cases, happen that you are not using the correct tool to find the information. Because of that, it's important to understand those bases, right? Nice. So let's continue. So we have this reference and open action linked with the JavaScript. Cool. So let's go to the next object two, nothing to, to lead to see. Object three. Take a look, this object four is another part of those, these three, referring object eight and nine. Remember how many objects we have here? 15. OK. In object seven, we have another reference, object 10. And not only that, but one of those references is, remember of the link about the JavaScript. Object eight is more you know, shiny things like a font, image. Object nine, you're referring the four, because this object is connected with another object, it referring others. In object 10, remember, they have the specific reference of JavaScript, but referring another, 12, with JavaScript. And here, take a look at this. We find this, the first streaming, OK? And here, you see, this is an I specifically flag, flat the code. It means we need the code, something. <laughs> it's simple. But now we need to decode why, what exactly. We need to decode this streaming, the content inside of this streaming. But if you see here, the left is 36. 
is a kind of small, but maybe we can look in from this specific object. Okay, let's continue to see the all objects. Object 12 referring object 13 that we found in specifically JavaScript, but take a look at this, and this specifically is the second one. Remember, we have two stream, and here the left is, is, is too big. When you compare with the first, right, it's too big. So maybe this is the focus that we to look in. This is the main object, okay? So let me go to the next, okay? So what I thought here, so I have the PDF, and they have an open action linked with a specific JavaScript, and I have an, a cool information inside of this specifically object 13. So I need to go too deeply in this, object, this specific object. But I need to use in something to, to show this information for me. Because I'm using PDF parser, and I didn't find anything with this. So I'm using, this case, PDF TK is another tool to manipulate PDF. It means that I can create PDF, I can merge PDF, and I can do other things. I can encode, I can use it for different purpose, not only that, but I can uncompress, recompress. So my idea is it was uncompress this specific information in object 13, okay? So basically I set here PDF, uh, PDF TK, the file, or output, because I would like to collect this output. Not only this, but the whole PDF, and I set the dump doc text to copy those information from this file and execute and compress to uncompress the file. So now we have here the PDF and the whole uncompressed file. Okay? Nice. So now I can look in more deeply and take a look what I found in the streaming. I found here the very interesting information. The JavaScript, it here, it's here. But if you know how this JavaScript, JavaScript works, you know that's not looks like a JavaScript. <laughs> Because, yeah, because this JavaScript is obfuscated. Because of that, it's, it's this way. So the next step, I need to copy this and pass in creating another file because I thought, so I'm talking about JavaScript. JavaScript, maybe I talk about the web application. So if I have an application, I can try to interpret that this in a specific HTML file. That's my idea. Because I found a specific evil parameter here and I can change in this file. My idea is to try to rewrite this specific JavaScript to obfuscate th this file, okay? And if you see specifically, the other thing interesting is a kind of standard here. Letters, percent, numbers, you see? In, inside of the parentheses, you know? And the color is different, so something is interesting here. But the first idea here is to rewrite. Remember, I, I set this specifically script here, and I put in document write to rewrite these informations because I'm using this specific parameter to obfuscate this JavaScript. So I save this file, and next step is to give the permission to access this file or to show this information for in the browse for us, okay? Nice, cool. So the next step is to execute this to see what is this kind of behavior or what kind of information I can find in this specific JavaScript obfuscator. So after that, open the Firefox browser and take a look what happened now. We have a payload. Nice. You know what is a payload? We have an exploit and you have a payload. You know, what, you know what's the difference basically? Yeah? You know? OK, let me clarify for something, because I don't see many hands, OK? So exploit is a, maybe it's a, a tool or a binary that you can use in to explore and specifically vulnerabilities, OK? And a payload is a package, is a code that you can download in specifically Victor machine to gain a specifically access or to receive a specifically reverse or reverse connection, actually. Okay, basically those different. So you're using the exploit as a tool to explore the vulnerability, and if you would like to, because of course, depend of the vulnerability that you are exploring, but if you like, sometimes you can download this exploit. It's a, a part of package that you download in the Victor machine to receive this connection reverse, a kind of reverse shell maybe, okay? So in this case, 
we had the specific code to explore a specific vulnerability in this case, because after I don't have a time to explain those uh, details or, or using dynamic analysis, just a simple uh, statistic analysis, but the attacker using a specific exploit to explore a specific vulnerability inside of the environment of the customer or the client. And after that, they you download this payload inside of the Victor machine. As you can see here, it's a payload responsible for starting the connection reverse with the CNC. So uh, now I could finish my, I could. Because remember, the idea when I investigate that is to identify if this PDF is malicious or, is not, or not. It's malicious. Point, you know. Um, but now we have a payload. So let's go more. Let's see what happened now. <laughs> cool. And if you see here, some remember the behavior like a number, letters, percent, or something are, are happening here. I don't know exactly. So let's go to continue to do. So I copied this code. And I my idea here is it was to clean, actually, to clean the, the file. Uh, I copy this, this file here, and I'm using sad, basically to cut the percent. Because, of course, after some times to try other things like this, I found the information that this payload, basically, the attacker using another technique, the encoding technique. Okay, They're using a specific technique here to encode this payload. Because remember, for the attacker perspective, they need to use Many techniques like anti-debugger, like uh, you know, encoding, like um, um, obfuscation, many other techniques to make more difficult our life <laughs> as a researcher, as an analyst, or whatever. Okay, so basically, this is as you can see here. Now we have here the 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 the, um, the information, the, the the real payload, not in real, but the payload encoded, and basically the attacker using here. The, the different techniques, because they don't use in here the ASCII, they use a new Unicode. It's a different, because it's based on two, in two binaries, not only in two bytes, not one byte has X ASCII works. So they use using specifically um, Unicode. So remember, they use it, the first they use a JavaScript obfuscated. Inside of this JavaScript, they're using the, um, the, the payload. And inside of this payload, they have a spe specific code using this technique in based on Unicode. So I'll explain more in your other thing, because maybe you are thinking, Philip, just using Unix, I would like to see if it's possible to use in Windows. OK. So I will continue to do the same analysis, but in Windows platform. Remember, we have here, I stopped here the investigation. When I found the, the encode, right, the code encoded. It's a kind of. OK, so I'm executing here the same. I mean, copy this, the payload, remember that, the payload here. And I copy and paste here using another platform, Mozilla. I don't know if you already heard about that, this, about these tools. So I pass here. And if you see here, this is the technique used by the attacker to inc Oh, my goodness. Let me go to the end again. This is the, let me put in stop here. OK, this encoding that the attacker is using is based on this specifically technique. UCS2 is a kind of old, because the evolution now it's called UTF-16, UTF-32, that you're using this. And the idea here is to, it's the same that I use in the set. I cut the percent, and I create in to, to generate this information in the EXA file, right? As you can see here, I click. And now I have the EXA file. Basically, this is the EXA file. When I cut the percent using SAD, I had the EXA file. But, I but using here the Mozilla, I have the EXA file. I generate a specifically binary, OK? Because my idea now is to, to try to find the CNC from the attacker. And after that, I try I use ensure to find in specifically information inside of this binary that I generate for HTTP. And now we have the command and controller 
from the attacker. Remember the payload? So the attacker is using those steps to, to go for this, this server, right? The, the, the command controller. The idea from the attacker for the attacker is when the, the attacker on the, the victim receive the file and download the payload, that this IP address will receive a connection, right? And I finish here just to show the information here about the specific IP address, as you can see. So they have other information, other URL related to the specific attack. But you see that this, uh, this IP address is totally linked to a specific attack, as you can see here. So we go step by step into these investigations. And now I finish the presentation. This is some books. If you'd like to read, understand more about the, the more analysis we have here about the, you know, specifically difference here, but uh, it's more this. So since the beginning to the advanced, here it's more focused in, in 3D hunting, uh, even uh, in 3D hunting, looking from the, the, the tools. And yes, thank you so much for this time. <laughs> Once again, it's a pleasure. Thank you. OK, uh, we have a short Q&A um, session. So uh, si vous avez des questions, signalez-vous auprès des personnes en rouge. Et uh, on va faire une session très, très, très... No questions. Très courte. <laughs> Very short. So I, I have... Maybe it's good or maybe it's bad. I don't know. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really, really interesting. I have a question here about uh, the payload actually that is uh, stored inside the PDF file. Let's say that we have a victim, for example, a target that will open the PDF file. How the payload will be executed? It is no click like the victim will be uh, compromised uh, without uh, just uh, like by uh, opening the file or he need like to activate something or uh no the the action is is for if you understand your question because i can hear you not so good but uh, is the flow of the infection uh, the user perspective right so yes. when user receive this this file let's suppose that you working in an hr team and you receive the cv the resume and the only action the user need to do is to open the pdf to read, to see it, one file, one file. After that, automatically, we're running all those steps, automatically. Because they have the specifically open action functions, link it with JavaScript, remember the JavaScript. This job, JavaScript is obfuscated. Inside of the JavaScript, you have the payload. This, this payload is responsible for callback to the CNC. You see, so the user don't need to click more than once. Just need to open once again, and that's it. So. May, if, of course, if user sh should have a specific secu security sensor, like antivirus or other thing like this, in the, in the, you know, in the laptop to protect, but because it's a known malware, actually the vulnerability, it's, it's a known vulnerability, and that's why I want to investigate that. But it's the flow, the only one click, and, just, and that, that's it. OK, thank you. Anyone more? Here, below, here, over there. Um, OK. Um, is this exploit uh, related uh, to, um, to Adobe? And, uh, or, uh, um, how did they say that? <laughs> uh, can I tell it in French and someone translate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. Est-ce que la faille elle est liée à uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader ou un truc comme ça ou, ou si on l'ouvre avec Chrome il uh, y aura la, le, les mêmes actions Est-ce que c'est clair <laughs> <laughs> En gros, est-ce que uh, cette faille elle est liée à Adobe Acrobat Reader donc uh, au lecteur de PDF d'Adobe ou bien c'est juste lié au, au format PDF okay. Donc is that uh, vulnerability linked either on PDF format in itself or in Acrobat Reader? 
Um, I don't remember exactly if this vulnerability was in a in a um, in a Crobat reader, but you know when you create, if you are would you like to try, for example, your security sensor, let's suppose that you are testing, okay. So you can create in this PDF. You can put in specifically exploit inside of this PDF using, for example, PDF TK to compress something or using in code, and you can explore the victim. So the point is, the exploit that you can put in the PDF, you can use each one desire, you know. And uh, I don't remember this exactly. If it was a specific vulnerability from the Acrobat, I don't, I really don't remember. But you know, you can use in whatever exploit you want. Of course, remember when you're using something to test, like if you see my in my my repository in on uh, on GitHub, I testing some security vendors, and I like to using. When I test something, I like to using, I, I, I like to go to for specific steps. So the first, I like to using no threads, like uh, no malwares, no exploits, no, to test how the engines the engines works, like uh, signatures, machine learning, or other things based on signatures. After that, I go to the, not a, not a zero day, but you know, it's a other techniques. But you can put in whatever exploit you want inside of this PDF. You you just need to or to know what kind of tools you can use in to put this information inside of that. Quelqu'un d'autre? Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Is there a way to mitigate or to disable the open action? Um, actually, good question. For the open action. Um, Actually, I, I I don't know, yeah, because it's uh, for me open action. I don't know if it makes sense some PDF open the other task like an open action because it's another activity from PDF. Maybe for the security perspective, probably in a security uh, sensors like uh, antivirus, as I mentioned, and or, or a binary that you have inside of the machine should have some specifically behavior like or related and specifically like if you have a pdf binary now a pdf it's a binary of course but you have a pdf so pdf have a specific action just open is sh shared information because if you put in the string in pdf you see like a text because pdf is a really text file but with image and fonts and shiny things but it's a it's a text so why they need to use in other activities like uh, because you don't use macros in PDF, I think, using you know in Word, in Excel, in other in Microsoft Office files, but in PDF usually not. So based on this behavior, you can use any specifically tag in, in antivirus. You can put this, for example, but for the specifically PDF or in the specifically machine, I I don't know exact. But I if I had if I you know, sh if I have the specifically security vendors, I will go for this way, you know, to look in front of the specific behavior from the PDF, or if some block to JavaScript is not, is is complicated because it depends of the application that you have inside of the organization, you see, and um, it's based on behavior. Basically, is how the um, the antivirus works. The new technology is based on behavior and machine learning. And many vendors uh, doesn't work with the signatures only from behavior, so the user need to click in the malware, and after that they you protect. I don't like this. I like to use them both, you know. So I don't need to check if it's malicious when I s know that is malicious. For me, it makes sense. And I talk with some, I talk with some vendors about that, and I have some fights. But anyway, it's another talk. <laughs> okay. Um, anything more? There. I go. I go there to hear more. <laughs> Hello. So yeah, it's working. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. Uh, then I think I have a question about the very last command, and it was the one to get uh, the information about the attacker, like uh, the search exor that exo one, I think. Uh, the question is about this script, whether it's a GitHub st st uh, script. Uh, whether it's something that you've downloaded, we need to download it from somewhere, or it's something, a tool that we can just like get on uh, Linux. So yeah. 
I don't know if you understand the question, but it's, it's based on the, the file or based on the, um, your question is about the specifically some tools to check? Yeah, I saw that you used uh, a tool, maybe f a file, which was Exorters, okay. I guess. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I'm uh, like, uh, I didn't see before. And there wasn't like a, uh, the reference, whether it's a GitHub file, whether it's a tool. Ah, okay. So yeah, my question is about the file itself. Okay, yeah, you c actually, the file is one I specifically command, right? And you can use in other commands that you can use to check those informations. Because for each, um, it's not investigation system operation, but you have, for example, the Kali Linux, if you read, for example, the Kali Linux, they have specifically suggestion to you. You, n you should be using, for example, Kali Linux has a desktop only for a specific purpose. In the same case, Aperot OS, we have a specific version. Inside of those tools, in this specific system operation, we have many tools to check. So you can use, in, for example, file. You can use in other tools to check. I don't remember other uh, check types of file now. Um, but one thing interesting about that, I don't know if I can I answer your question, but is about a specific vulnerability in the specific tools. Because I remember in 2000, uh, Eight, if I don't, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, and a specific vulnerability in a string command. When you execute in a string command, something happened. You can using the string command to explore the, the the environment, but I don't remember. I don't try in, in that time, but you can use in different tools. You can use in you know, um, again, you can use in some commands like uh, I don't use in here, but you can use in for example read. Uh, read PE, it's a kind of tool to check the structure and the information about the, PD, the, the portable executable, the PE, or you can use read ELF, it's the same for the, the, the Linux, and you can check the structure of the binaries and how is the sessions and all those references. Okay, so this, is, uh, this wasn't something that you structured like for your needs or something that's available online on open sources like uh, so? Yeah, yeah, just to need to download the, the Linux, the Unix, uh, you need to download the Kali Linux or Perot OS. And usually you have these tools on those machines. Or even you, you can download the, the Ubuntu. You can find there Ubuntu, Debian, because it's, a, it's like a file. It's a, I think it's open. Basically, it's a kind of you, don't, you, you can use in, you know, APT install, and that's it. OK, thank you. It's, it's just that it's a tool that it's the, fir the very first time that I see the XOR thing, and I thought it was a library that it Yeah, those tools that I use is totally open source. It is, I is embedded in the, in the Unix platform. In this case, for example, on the for the PDF perspective, I'm using <coughs> some many uh, commands and tools from DDA Stevens. And inside of the blog of the DDA Stevens, they have a specifically package to using those tools in Windows. So okay. you can download the zip file, and compress this, and after that you can use in so many tools. He developed many, many, many tools. It's very nice. Of course, in Linux it's more easier, you know, to put in those open source Always. tools. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for the talk. It was quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Mm. Thank you all. Uh, merci à tous.